All right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad you're here to join us today for our webinar on the low code era and how companies can accelerate their sales processes and empower employees to overcome market disruptions. Uh, we'll do a quick round of uh, introductions uh, to make sure you all know who your speakers are. And this, this right here, I'm Andy Zambito and I'm the Chief Sales Officer for the Americas at Creatio. I'm quite excited to be leading today's uh, panel and what you're all here, of course, to hear from is our panelists. So I'll go just clockwise around my screen here and let's uh, start with uh, Sebastian Forget, if you can please introduce yourself for our audience. Yes, thank you. So I'm Sebastian uh, Forget. Uh, founder of Solution Metrics, a CRM implementation company. And, and since I'm spending most of my time in sales, I'll be pleased to uh, contribute to uh, today. So we're not. Uh, Sam, how about yourself? Um, I'm the founder of Technology Advisors, ex-college professor, and um, been in CRM uh, and, we're in digital transformation for too many years. And cer certainly not least, uh, Bill Zarbach. Hello, Bill Zarbach, Meritus Business Solutions. I'm a co-founder of the company. Been doing this for a long time. The last 10 working years with AT&T, I implemented CRM systems for 2,000 salespeople. It actually started database marketing to Salesforce automation to CRM. Last 20 years, helping customers implement CRM, and most recently immersed into low-code and no-code. Well, we certainly love that. This is a topic, as you can imagine, given my role, that's near and dear to my heart about accelerating sales. That's uh, that's always uh, a big piece for me. Uh, but you know, we we've all been uh, experiencing this this the, the pandemic on a global basis, and now I think it's been uh, around long enough for organizations to start to have to uh, adapt. I'd love to open up with the first question of just what what sales technology trends have you seen being emerged from the pandemic so more, more of a, a, a wider question to, to start us out with but i think we're, we've been in it long enough to see things start to emerge i'd love to get your take as as experts in the field i don't think um so i think things are emerging but i think they were already emerging prior to the pandemic and i think the pace of acceleration has exceeded everyone's expectation I think when you look at things like buying online and getting delivery, um, that has changed uh, dramatically. It's changed the way Black Friday works. We're never going back to the old way. We're not going to have those doorbusters anymore. I think you're <laughs> going to see that happen with business as well. We're all working from home. A lot of businesses do a pretty good job of working from home. That has an implication on the supply chain of office space, on real estate on technology, on the cost of equipment. Um, I even, if you look at your own P&Ls, how much are we expending on travel and expense? Pretty much zero. And that's hitting our bottom line. And other businesses are seeing the same thing. And so it's time for them to make an investment. Mm -hmm. I agree with Sam. Uh, I agree with Sam in, in everything he said. I think the customers were in flight. They were implementing, it was digital transition transformation they were involved in. Nobody woke up on uh, the first of the year thinking we we're going to have a global pandemic. So it accelerated everything. And what it means is, is not only do people need to be able to work from home, but to be able to provide the bandwidth for companies to do that. And how can salespeople stay connected, find, attract, and stay connected with their customers? So it's affected everything that was evolving. And now the trends are trying to figure out what can you do quickly that's directionally right for the long term. Absolutely. And I, I concur with everything that's been said. And an important uh, piece of the sales cycle uh, in, in B2B so is building the trust. So which normally was, uh, before the pandemic, uh, things you will most of the time do on site, right? So you'll be shaking hands, go for dinner, then you understand. And so this is now done remotely, which is which which was challenging at the beginning. But I think in, in B2B at least, uh, people learn how to trust people in a remote way. So I think that's that's where we cross that chasm of saying, 
now everyone is, is or not everyone, but most are comfortable doing uh, B2B deals remotely. So which at, the, at first it was kind of, of difficult for us because people say, okay, I'm going to give the, you know, a big mandate or, 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 or you know, something that's strategic. It's not just commodity. It's, 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 it's something very involving for a team. So how are we going to build the trust with a, a vendor um, remotely? So that, that was difficult. Now, emerging of, of technology. So for sure, you have the Zoom, the Teams, and you have all kinds of, you know, we're using uh, virtual whiteboards and stuff where people can build the trust and say, okay, those guys, I'm trusting them remotely. So I think we, we achieved that as well. So that, that, that's great. Sebastian, do you think though that it, the, it really turns sales more transactional than they were before? Because I, I sort of see the fact that the people who are following the process that they might have been in your organization are probably just doing fine unless they're in, you know, um, renting beach houses. Um, but, um, uh, you know, the, it's the companies where they didn't have solid processes. Those mm -hmm. are the companies that are struggling in my mind today. Absolutely. 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 So, so you're absolutely right. I share the same, uh, same thought. So, um, and, and everyone tries to fit, right, this standard process of, okay, I'm going to engage with a bunch of people and try to select three vendors at the end and then pick the one, the best uh, out of the three, right? And that, that for some people were super challenging because, you know, you need at the end the leap of faith when you have not engaged with people on a personal, right, engagement and building that trust. So you're absolutely right. Uh, some people were not super structured to do so. Um, that's why I, I believe that there's still some people say, okay, and we feel it, right? There's, there's companies that say, I'm not going to do it remotely. I'm going to wait for the pandemic to be over to do some of the project because they're not comfortable engaging in a, in a remote way. So, uh, but that, that I, I, yeah, I, I to, to your point, Bill, I, and, and Sam, I think it accelerated the thing. I see the pandemic is, it, the analogy is when, you know, there's the big meteorite that arrives and the dinosaurs has died. Some species could adapt. Some died. I think that's, that's the thing that happened. Well, let, let me let me follow up and challenge that. So, from a from a technology perspective, I've heard all of you talk about obviously the the acceleration and, and having to build trust, and and it's happening now through you know, people are communicating through digital uh, channels more. Um, certainly, I think you know uh, Gartner's predicting you know in the next couple of years, eighty percent of of these interactions will be all through digital. When you think of it as when you deal with all of your customers, because you you all have extensive customer interactions. What are they seeing specifically from their sales challenges then? Because we talk about a number of different processes kind of in the generalized sense. When you think about, let's bring it back to, to selling for a moment. Um, what, what selling challenges have, have kind of emerged here and that they're now faced with that they weren't before? I think that we see some customers that have never had so much demand for their products and services. They're fortunate enough to be in those industries. industries. Others, where their customers have been affected by COVID, so they're feeling slowdown. So it's across the board. So we're trying to work both sides of that. Those that aren't able to move ahead as quickly as they wanted, they still have some needs, how to deal with that, and how to sell, accelerate those that need more faster right now, how to do that. So it's, it's really a, a very interesting time because we have both camps. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing. We've got we've got one client who makes airplane parts. I mean, you know, they're um, they're 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 basically put the project on hold halfway through development. It's now one year later, and um, you know, they uh, they're, they're hopefully they'll go live in the next 12 months. But you know, until people start flying again, there's no demand for airplane parts. And you know, we have another client I'm working with is a startup. And it's a medical startup, and uh, we can't spend enough hours in a week working with them um, because they got all this funding because they're going to do well in this type of world. Mm -hmm. How are they making those investments? So if they if they're having that acceleration, what are the investments that they're looking to do, and why? So um, so we're actually helping them figure out uh, the priorities right now of what they need because they need so many things. Uh, but we've all agreed with them that it's it's going to be a digital solution. Uh, 
So uh, for them, the, the, the major priorities are getting things like portals and mobile apps up um, and AIs and bots, um, so they need less people. Uh, they're looking at um, um, growing, uh, if their projections are right, they'll be a $50 million company in three years from zero. And, wow. and they're going to do it with about 10 salespeople because everything else is going to be automated and process driven because they, they, they're starting from zero. And when you start from zero, when, when the building is burned down, you can make a brand new building any way you want. And that's what they're doing. And they don't have to deal with an existing infrastructure and the politics. And I think that's the real interesting thing. The companies that are going, you know, someone said to me right in the beginning of this whole thing, it says, when you shut down the factory, you paint the factory. Okay. And it's true. When you shut down the factory, you paint the factory. And we are seeing that now. The guys who have painted the factory are coming out of this and they can't run. They're running downhill. You know, they can't they can't stop their feet moving and, and otherwise they're going to fall. And and then the people who didn't do that, they're trying to figure out how to open their doors. They're still running uphill. Yep. Absolutely. For, for the rest of you then. So for, for those of businesses that that aren't in that kind of luxury position, right, I mean, these more established organizations, sales isn't going to go away for them. They still need to figure it out. What, what are some of the challenges they're bringing to you now saying, OK, if, if this is a prolonged state of existence that we're going to be in and doesn't resolve itself where we can't necessarily wait it out. Uh, what, what are some of the challenges they're trying to solve today on the sales what I side? Find, what I find, Andy, is their industry is creating change. Their competitors are changing the way that they do business, causing our clients to have to figure out how to react. And I can tell you, those that have a system that allows low code, no code, are able to react much faster than those without. And I know that's part of our theme today, but I've seen it. A couple have come in, so we need this this week. Some, it's just impossible. Others, a couple of days, they have their low code new process up and running. It's, it's quite interesting to see that, the contradiction of, of those two types of, of approaches to, to systems that they have. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you're so right, Bill. Because I, I, I believe that the purchasing cycle of customer has changed. So companies need to adapt their sales cycle, sales cycle to the purchasing cycle of their customer. And since it had changed pretty them, you know, quickly, some cannot adapt. Some what would be a, can you give us an example of that, Sebastian, that you're seeing? Okay, so, so for example, um, we know that more and more uh, consumer want, don't like to be sold for sure, so they're gonna get, they're gonna be, they're gonna educate themselves before actually engaging, engaging with a vendor. So just tracking the digital behavior of your prospect, not everyone does that. The guys who have the newest tools like Creatio, you know, when you engage, the digital profile is as good as your traditional sales profile. Right, it's becoming way more important. So we, so people come at us and say, "Okay, I would like to do retargeting and and digital tactics and strategies in order to engage with my customer, not only by cold call and 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 calling the guy all the time and running after them uh, on the phone." So that, that puts an interesting position, right? So so you know, I'm a sales leader. You you talk with sales leaders. The there are so many. Uh, technologies that are now targeting sales leaders saying, I recognize that you have a problem. How does that leader cut through the and, and differentiate between the technology that's, you know, hype because, hey, we're in a pandemic, check this out versus what what do you see as as the necessity investments? Absolutely. So the goal is to be pertinent because you're absolutely right, Andy, we receive, you know, all of us like 500 emails per, per day and <laughs> Going on, you know, on Amazon, on the web, and we got all those banners. So it's to be pertinent. But the trick to be at the right moment with the right content, start with a, a good platform, right? Because this is where you can capture the, again, the purchasing cycle of where my customer is. So is this just curious and looking what my company can do at you know, at the beginning or is really far in his purchasing cycle and is looking to do a transaction 
or, 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 or doing something like in the next 30 days, right? So depending on how you get this information, so you need to be smart, but once you have that, it changed the way you engage with people. So, so the goal is to be pertinent. And I think there's two main component is be, be, have the right content and the right messaging at the right time. Either Sam or, or Bill, anything you want to add to that? Or I'm trying to think the context of the question. If I think in terms of a business leader trying to figure out the infrastructure and the systems that they need now, giving all the marketing literature they get, it really comes down to what channels do you want to be in? How do you attract, interact with customers? What do you need to make your people productive? How can you implement change quickly? How do you get access to information to do all that? So it's really those basics. And I think at the heart of it, business process, integration, and, and certainly as we're talking about the low code, no code, being able to implement new processes quickly is extremely relevant for business leaders. I know when I'm evaluating software and um, what I do is I try to figure out what is the software trying to solve? What's the initiative, right, associated with that software? So you work backwards because the software is just a bunch of use cases realized. And so you have to sort of think higher and say, what, what, how do I categorize this software? What's its initiative? And then you can say, what other things, what other pieces of software solve that same problem? And now you can go out and do a, a valid comparison to say, is that the best piece of software? And, you know, and is it, and then you have to understand what, what's driving it. How quickly is it to implement? What is it going to cost? What's my total cost of ownership? You know, does this actually solve my problem? You know, and plus, I don't think yeah. people understand what problems are important to them. I, I went for, uh, yesterday, I had a five hour meeting with a client who likes to meet face to face during pandemics. Um, <laughs> and four of us met in a huge conference room, standing in corners um, and with masks and everything. Um, and I can tell you that uh, it took four hours to figure out for them to figure out what their top five priorities were for sales and marketing. So that's a, that becomes a, a, that in itself for a lot of customers is the challenge. They're so overwhelmed with transitional change uh, that, that they can't even figure out what are the important things to do today and what can wait till day two. So I, I think this this brings us actually to the heart of the the discussion today to some degree because if I if I put together the pieces of everything I've heard right I mean we're dealing with transitional change, rapid acceleration, custom you know this is all about how do we interact with the customers. So when you're you guys all have a wealth of years in the the CRM world when you're you're dealing with folks that are looking at um, they have maybe a traditional CRM or Bill I think I understand a little bit of where you're coming from on the on the low code side. What, what are you looking at here when you're having those discussions with them around the pros and the cons of, of this environment and where they may need to be in order to accommodate, right? Because all those those pains you, you've been outlining um, are not going to go away, right? I mean, it's something they're going to be forced to deal with. And so what, what guidance would you give around the kind of the, the pros or cons of, of leveraging a standard CRM solution versus taking a different approach? I'd start by wanting to know if they can think in a business process sense. You know, when the word use cases, do they think in terms of use cases? Can they logically think through steps? Are they doing that now? And given that they are, then what is their environment? A lot of times they have large IT staff. So the technology is as important as if they have a lot of departments where they have the same need. So I would want to separate out there. What I think is becoming important is speed. No matter what, speed is important. So ease of implementation of whatever you do is becoming a differentiator. So that's where I would say is look for, if we're th thinking about a, a low code solution, ease of implementation, think through the audience that's going to do it. The term citizen developer has come about. And I don't know that a lot of large companies want everybody developing their apps, but I think everyone can understand what's needed and can describe it in terms of use cases to be able to make a group, whichever group that is, be able to implement it, and speed is key. Yeah, I, I think Bill's absolutely correct on that. And what a cool part about low code is if you look at implementation cycles, 
right? You, you look at, say, a third spent up front in the design planning strategy, a third is in the building, and then a third of it is about deployment and testing and quality control. Um, you're taking that middle third and you're compressing it down to 10%. You know, you're taking one third of that time to build. So you've just saved 21% of the project. And then because the low-code tools, particularly Creatio's low-code tool, has the, a lot of design elements inside of that tool, you're also compressing some of the design phase. You know, and so all of a sudden now, instead of having something that takes 100% of the time, now you have something that only takes 60 or 50% of the time. You know, and then I think that's critically important. I think the other thing that makes low code interesting is you can prototype and, and go live and roll it back if you don't like the solution. And now that doesn't mean that's my preferred way of, of implementing. My preferred way of implementing is actually thinking uh, before we <laughs> implement. Uh, but but it allows people who you know really don't know what the best way to go is to quickly rapid prototype something, try it out, and toss it away because it'll it just took half the time it would have. Absolutely, and, and I, I concur. And and what I like is is as well from the local is when the organization decide to be customer centric, which the you know they are doing more than ever during the pandemic is by being local no code approach, you can adapt to your customer, right? Since you're customer centric, if not, it's becoming difficult. And your the tolerance for for being tough to do business with, I think it's there's no more tolerance for that. So, so, so I think Sam, by the way, I really like that that analogy. Give you you were able to kind of tap into a, one certain way to look at ROI, even just from the implementation side of things, right? Just getting getting there. Um, but Sebastian, I want to touch on something you just mentioned. So. I, I'm a believer that this idea of, of even being customer centric is is changing, right? If you think about the way we used to think about customer centric and technology, how how are you all seeing that today? What what does it mean in this modern kind of instrument and almost all digital world that we're going to 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 have a, a, the ability to be customer centric? And when you're kind of talking to a, a customer about their maturity level on that that curve, mm -hmm. well, you know, I think the issue with um, Customers, uh, first of all, I think some customers don't understand what customer centric is. Um, uh, we have a, we have a lot of customers out there that we have to sort of educate them on customer centric. Customer centric then means they're following their process, okay, <laughs> not not the customer's process. Uh, but it it means real time adaptation. That's that's really what customer centric comes down to. Um, you you obviously want to have a series of messages that um, tries to guide a customer down an appropriate path of building and selecting and deploying a piece of software. But at the end of the day, they may not, you may not be able to convince them. And customer centric really means adapting your process for that um, customer. And, and I saw a little great commercial from American Express for a small business uh, Saturday. And um, they talked about why work with small businesses. And as the, one of the people they were interviewing said, small businesses will do anything for their customers, which is really true. Big businesses don't, they're stuck in their processes. The small business owners will, oh, you need a ship, I'll ship it. You need this uh, ship and gift wrap, we'll do that. Right, that's that's customer centric, and so what happens is the the problem is is in the evolution of a of a of a company, the Harvard Business School methodology was if from books like Emith, right? Oh, you you got to automate your processes, you got to make them consistent. In fact, we even measure that with things like SOC two. We say how well are you fitting against your processes? But the reality to remain customer centric. You have to have adaptable processes, and you have, and you have, and that's really the key that you have to be able to change those processes to meet the customer's expectations. It's really about fashioning your products around what customers need, be able to serve it up to them in a way they want to be reached, promote to them so you can find them and attract them, and just be able to have, you know, the efficiency of taking care of servicing that through its life cycle. It's everything around the customer. 
Absolutely, it's. I, I agree. It's it's the experience you want to provide. You know, I think one great company I like to to when we talk about uh, customer centric is Disney, right? So not only their brand is really strong, but it's from if we all been to to Disneyland, right? From the moment you get to the airport, you know. So this is customer centric. So they look back and say, okay, this is what our customer wants, and they adapt to it. Absolutely. It uh, it does really kind of bring you around to, for I'm hearing from you guys also that that complete uh, life cycle for the customer because I'm hearing you talk about from them doing their initial research. Maybe we can talk for a moment about that because it, it one of the things I think about is that a lot of businesses in their kind of older school thinking about this are still compartmentalizing their activities that they have with uh, customers as separate. Uh, so maybe mm -hmm. we can just talk for a moment about how are you how are you helping kind of bridge that uh, concept? Because if we're hearing customer centric, you're talking about one single customer, yet they're orchestrated around. I have marketing efforts to acquire a customer. Now I want to sell and close them. Now I'm going to service them. So uh, how how are you kind of resolving that? Yeah, I, I personally go in and 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 try to educate on everything in sales and marketing. The way you send the invoice is a marketing initiative as well. You need to perceive all the interaction point as a sell and marketing. Because people understand it in the sales and marketing that you need to be nice <laughs> in order to get the sell. <laughs> so it, 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 from, you know, like I said, the way you collect money, the way you send your invoice, your whatever, your interaction interaction point are sales and marketing. So that's 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 how I I try to 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 help business to see. So uh, and and then they, they they slowly but surely get, get that and, and, and from there you know they can adapt their process and they can do it in very fast way with the local no code platform that we're talking about here. And it also a lot of it comes down to having the right information systems to allow the organizations to see for themselves. As a consulting company, you can't go in and tell a company that they're not organized right, and they may have a hard time even figuring it out. But if they can see how many customers are we attracting, how many customers do we have, what's our product saturation, how are we doing, are we selling the products we want, or what's the life cycle there? If companies have the ability to see all of that and then have the ability to react to that, I think that's where they need to be. So uh, a lot of it now is just getting arms around to help companies figure out where they're at and where do they need to go. And certainly COVID has made a frantic need to people do things much faster than ever before. I think it also means letting customers work the way they want to work. And I'll, I'll, I'll share a, a funny story. Um, uh, I got a, about four, three years ago, I, I switched over to a, a, a alternative cable streaming service called T-Vision by T-Mobile. Um, I got a letter about a month ago saying they're ending that service uh january to so there's a box just throw the box away we don't we don't need it but january <laughs> one you're not going to have the service so this weekend i if they're doing excruciating research i picked an alternative went online found out i can't cancel my account uh online i've got to call an 800 number um to actually cancel the actually cancel the account and unfortunately it's only between nine o'clock and five o'clock eastern time that i can call that number to actually cancel the account so they have gave me a bad experience by canceling the service not providing an alternative even though they have an alternative solution i just chose not to go with it anymore because i don't trust t-mobile <laughs> and they won't let me cancel the account now that i got a replacement <laughs> so yeah, so that's a that, great that's a great example of a bad experience. Bad experience. Yeah. And so the real the real thing is that that you want to have really good experiences. And you see, you're right, Disney had incredible experience. American Express, incredible experiences. You the big companies who are forward thinking before the pandemic, they provide, you know, really good experiences. Those are the companies that are surviving. The small companies who are adapting in real time, they're the ones. It's the people who refuse to change. Those are the ones going out of business, you know? So so when you approach that and say, so, you know, we, we've now talked around that. And so if you, if, if low code is, is one of the, the ways to do this, how do you approach them about 
and, and approach swiftly kind of configuring or reconfiguring, if you will, their entire sales processes or, or just customer experience processes, um, you know, to do that. So, um, well, we're working with a lot of our customers right now to, uh, first of all, understand and, and really understand, but to document what their minimum uh, viable solution is to go live with. And then we're also identifying things that just aren't working. You know, we have one customer that uh, they get all their leads through events. They go to big trade shows and they're floundering now. And we converted them over to account-based marketing uh, uh, within about a six week period. And they're now seeing success generating a pipeline uh, doing that approach. Um, so I think it's it's identifying, helping them identify for themselves what's not working by doing by having discussions that are, uh, first of all, just logical discussions about why things won't work anymore. Right. And then the second part is trying to back it up with any type of numbers you can get and then proposing what alternative solutions other people are doing and then having and then educating them on which one would be the best for them. And hopefully they trust you as an advisor and take your word. I think the discussion How, still yeah. is around speed. And what does it mean to a company if their competition comes in and steals all their customers? How would they react? So speed is always going to be, it's going to cut across all companies. If you were to ask someone, do you want speed? Nobody's going to say, no, of course they do. <laughs> so the question is, is, well, how do you do it? And what does it really mean? So just that as a backdrop, how does that change their, their processes if speed is a component? And when you start looking at it from that aspect, they may need, in some cases, a, a different system or process to be able to enable that. And if that is the case, they certainly are going to want to at least consider a system that has low code, no code. Yeah. Yeah, I, I slightly disagree with you on this, Bill. Um, and here's why. I think it's speed done right. I don't disagree about the low code at all. I, I think you have to have that. But I think there has to be um, a, a bit of thinking ahead of time <laughs> about what is the best and correct way to do things prior to then throwing it in a low code environment and getting it done quickly. I see so many people trying things that are, aren't thoughtful and mm -hmm. therefore causing themselves more problems, um, even though they're using low code tools. So I think, mm -hmm. I think we all have to be mindful of what our problems are before we try to go solve stuff. So I didn't so want to by infer that you go out and buy a system and then retrofit it in, not at all. Okay. But as they're figuring out what to do, I think the constant drumbeat is, and you want to do that quickly, right? And then that factors into that thinking. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the companies who are really smart about it is they are very humble and they listen a lot. They don't try to be, okay, I'm a jack of all, you know, I'm, I'm this great guy, I know it all. The, the, the smarter company listen, and then they execute fast and adapt. So uh, it's it's so 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 to your point, Sam. You know, you, I, the, some have, you know the good to great and the Harvard Business Review and stuff. And yes, so but listen. I think we're we're in today's world. We need to listen more than try to figure it out because we have the people who wants to tell us our customer and prospect. They will tell you what they don't like about you. You just need to listen, I think. And the companies are smart. They listen, they execute. So I want to make sure, because our audience here could be comprised of, of folks that, that have varying degrees of, of understanding. And so it sounds like all of you have kind of come to a similar conclusion point that, that low code is a, a powerful weapon in, in solving this acceleration challenge and, and the disruption. Can you uh, maybe unpack that a bit for some of our, our audience who may not be as as low code savvy as what specifically we're, we're speaking of here, particularly as it, it pertains to allowing this excel or facilitating this acceleration. Yes, I, and I'll go first uh, if, if, uh, if you don't mind. So what, so low code, no code is great. What I don't like about this terminology, it's, it's speak about code, right? 
So, and it's low code is made for people who don't like to code. So that's why it's a, it should be don't code at all. So what it means, so because it sounds technical when you speak about low code, no code, it's just because people see, look at it, say code or oh, code equal programmer. So that's the opposite. Local no code should be, we don't need that much development, right? So most of the initiatives you will put forward comes from configuration. So, and like you explained, Sam, it cuts your design phase, your testing phase, and your deployment phase. So it, it cuts a lot of, of, of the time required normally when you code, right? So, so to me, local no code, is a, a, I don't, for people who are not coder, because that's at first who we're addressing the local no code platform to, is configuration versus coding. So it's a configuration more than a coding platform. I think for our team, when we start, first started getting into what we're calling low code, no code, it was a paradigm because everything there for before was all written with code and that's kind of the native state and actually like it. But in reality, when they started using and getting into more and it could do a lot of the standard things like ask a question or go access a piece of information to be able to just drag a widget on a screen and have it do that and then still be able to go deep in the coding that they knew. I think it's that balance. So it's really, working with customers, if they can articulate what they're trying to do in a consistent, quick, organized way that's repeatable, then they're halfway there. And then the question is, is why do you do that? And so uh, maybe the, Sebastian's right. Maybe we should stay away from the terminology, but it's being able to implement business processes quickly. And I also think there's two different types of low code, no code. There is low code, no code for like an analyst or a citizen developer, and there's low code no code for developers. And if you look at some of the mobile applications, low code applications, there are low code for developers. You still use code, but you put in one line of code and it takes care of all the login information, all the forgot your password, everything you could expect, all the screens are already built, one line of code. Um, and that, and you're seeing that trend show up as well, but then you have the low code like Croatia, which is really a citizens where I'm a business analyst, I'm documenting processes and I'm automating them all at the same time. And and I think, you know, we have to, I think there needs to be another word to, to distinguish between the two <laughs> different types. No, but I think, I think you guys have done a good job of, of unpacking it. So then let's to bring it back around. What would be some good specific examples, right? If you were talking to an organization about, because we're talking about today about, you know, sales processes. So let's specifically bring it back to that. What, what, uh, what can sales teams build and automate with low code that you'd be out there talking to them about? So I, I can start with an example. So uh, in some company, uh, so let's talk about the sales department. So the quote to order, right? So, or an approval process to a, from a, to a quote, sometimes can be complicated because uh, quoting can be, you need some people who's gonna put together a bill of material and so, this this if if in some platform can be complex and take two three four five days local no code you can you know adapt that create roll out that uh you know in a day or two and then your process and then when you update that flow you know you don't need a, a few hours and and uh and you're done in terms of adapting so uh, yeah we have a video on our website where we build out an expense module with approval in 30 minutes <laughs> using Creatio's low-code platform. Now, we thought about what we needed to build ahead of time, but the entire video is starting with a blank slate, and when we're done, you actually have an expense module. So that's Amazing. a real good example. And we've, we've, I can see the sample tracking, the, 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 the things that are, are effectively data manipulation with process, those work out really well with, with low-code environments. We had a real time example during COVID where a customer who used to meet face to face with say in hotels and you know in ballrooms and all that with their customers, they decided they needed to start using webinars. And so it was really rather straightforward. You have 
the customer in Creatio. They wanted to be able to create a webinar. There was an integration hook to this new webinar that they had never had before, their API, some configuration, and they were able to add it. And the, the while it was worked on for, evolved for a while, the initial getting it to be able to put somebody in a webinar in a, in a chair was one or two days at most. And that could have never happened before. So it was just a natural process of using this tool that they had. Have you guys, uh, those are great examples, by the way, so thank you for that. Um, have you, have there been examples where having this kind of low code CRM has not only helped meet these new needs, but helped kind of discover new customer needs as an example? I'm just curious on that side. Well, I think customers always have needs, but the ROI isn't there to implement them. And low code provide, drive, drives the bar down for things that you can automate that they've always wanted to automate. So if they have a process that runs once a quarter and it takes someone eight hours, but in the old days it would it would cost them, you know, uh, 10,000 bucks to implement, they would never do that. They would just spend the eight hours. But now all of a sudden, because it's a, it's a maybe a thousand dollar process now, um, all of a sudden they're going, well, yeah, let's implement that. So we're seeing a lot of that. I think I saw yeah, the okay. same thing. Once they see it, it starts stimulating thoughts and then they'll say, well, maybe we could do this process or that process or whatever. And one leads to another and they gain experience, they have comfort on how to do it. And it just evolves. And over time now, they have a whole set of processes that wraps a, a major umbrella around a piece of work that they did before that might have been ad hoc and not, you know, certainly not consistently. Mm -hmm. And and to answer your question, not necessarily on customer, but also what low code, no code helps is user adoption for, mm -hmm. for company because uh, we've we all been in, in the CRM world for many years and too often we see those big, huge platform that, you know, it's not, it's, it's difficult to be used and, and we've seen it, right? There's 40% of CRM implementation that failed because of user adoption because of a lack of user adoption so local no code alleviates that risk as well so uh so how, how is it how is it doing that maybe unpack that for me a bit so when you're in local no code you're most of the time you'll be an agile way to implement the software and i think uh, we all are so every two weeks you have a sprint you review with the users and they say you know what it's not exactly how we 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 like we like it or we would like to have this process as well and that we would like to make it simpler for us and you have different use cases right and you're not in a dynamics of pulling all the time change requests because it's so quick to do you say no problem and then you are not super agile in implementing those so at the end you have a product that people like because and, and, and not necessarily pandemic related, but we're seeing more and more businesses say, I want my employees to be happy when they're using my systems. Because, you know, they, 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 they use Airbnb, they use uh, Uber, they use all those apps, and then they come to work and they using this, you know, super old system. So that's also a, a benefit of local no code. So it's not customer specifically, but uh, definitely user adoption and, and 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 employee engagement into delivering better customer uh, experience. Wonderful, I appreciate that. Now, one one of you had mentioned uh, machine learning earlier as well. Are you seeing that being combined into the low code frameworks? And and if so, how? Big time. One of our customers wanted to be able to dynamically distribute leads. And so we used, we implemented a machine learning algorithm to give it to the, the person that was most likely to make the sale who had been the longest without a lead. And so we're seeing that, that that's going to be more and more. Yeah, T tell me, another example is, tell me which customer I should be calling back or should be visiting. So based on the different data points that you get when you're, you know, connected from a 360 degree profile, but absolutely. So, uh, you know, and that's, we talk about local, no code, but the, the, the modern platform like Gratio transformed from CRM being a glorified Rolodex to 
huh, a tool that's going to help me sell more. So uh, yeah. we have a ahead, client Sam. we're building a mobile app for that will uh, help manage type two diabetes, and um, uh, we're using learning machines to uh, actually send messages back when they report uh, their insulin levels and things like that, and they're what they're eating during the day. So it literally will say Amazing. good job to <laughs> you need to see a doctor right now, uh, uh, depending on the situation. And we're using emails and text messages to teach the machines because that's how they communicated prior. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So I have to say though, from from a, if you're a, a, a novice listening in, we've talked about bringing in machine learning, we've talked about automating processes, we're talking about you know building new processes, and it sounds amazing. So what what skill level or what would a, a sales team what what capabilities would they need to have to be able to take advantage of all these things that you mentioned from the sales team is just be able to articulate the need because i think the it groups will largely know how you know particularly when you get into machine learning and some of those type things but depending upon the, the how the companies organize maybe some basic processes the citizen developer can Come about and they can do some of it. But I would say, first off, just think in terms of process, think through future, what would you like to do, and bring it back to a group that's responsible for doing it. And if that platform has the tools to do it, um, it so much of it is achievable today. I think you change a reward mechanism for your sales team to, to provide accurate and complete data. Otherwise, learning <laughs> machines don't really learn. <laughs> Well, I guess the question isn't just about machine learning. It's also about taking advantage of all this low code ah, okay. process and pieces. You're, you're, yeah, that, that's just well, I agree with bit, uh, So they weren't <laughs> dovetailed. Yeah, it's just thinking more about how how do these sales teams take advantage of all this acceleration and the the low code? Do they need you know a different set of uh, of skills or is it something they can take advantage of now? Yeah, I, I, what's good? I, I think within the sales organization, all, often you will have a sales admin or someone a sales coordinator, so you can train that that person in order to do some of the configuration work, so they don't have to go to the IT department and officially put a request through to, you know, so they can be autonomous in 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 managing it. Now, sometimes IT will say, okay, I want to. Right, green light everything. Make sure it's 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 what the work's been done is great. But they can do the work themselves, so they don't have to go to the IT department. So they, it can make them really really a job. So it sounds like you guys are having a uh, lot. This kind of a big question because I know we're coming closer to the end of time. Uh, and since you're having these conversations with the the, the business leaders and the sales leaders uh, regularly, and obviously low code CRM is one of the things that you're talking a lot about. What recommendations are you making to these uh, sales leaders and, and on both about how, how they approach this and what they can do to increase the adoption of the technology once it's there? I think there are two different questions. One in terms of generally when we a customer is coming in to us and they're looking, they're, they're probably looking at more than one system. It's rare that some company just goes out and looks at one. So what we stress, particularly in the low code, is try it, have a bake-off, have a, have a defined use case, and let each, each product try it to see how they win. Because what we're confident is we really like Creatio, and we're seeing the speed at which things can be implemented to achieve results. So I think that is a big thing. And then to look at, does it have the breadth of supporting what you need? One big thing is, can you make changes to an existing process? And if so, what does it do about the processes that are in flight that are already there? Can the system accommodate that? So come up with a list of important things that you would need to do. Train your, your workforce on how to identify it and articulate and bring it together. But you know, first off, just look at the basics, speed, ease of use, and the ability to uh, have the people that would be developing or implementing it know that they can do it as well. And there's nothing better than a trial. How about for the rest of you? You know, I think the impact is not on sales as much as it's on IT. Um, and I think IT's role is changing, uh, particularly because of low-code tools. Uh, they've now, they, they've added, although they've always been responsible for it, they've never really done a good job of developing standards. 
okay? But they have to develop standards and guidelines on when people can use low tool code and when they can't. And then we need to let we let we need to get IT uninvolved with the with the sales organization so that they can use the low code tools freely and to their success. And I think that's that's the IT wants to be involved in everything usually. And and you know the reality is that they need to be stepping back now. I, I can echo that. Before I come to you, Sebastian, I also had a conversation just uh, last week where I think that was the comment is once. Once their data was integrated, they said, I, I don't want IT anywhere near our organization from that point forward. And, and uh, no, I think that speaks to what you're talking about is it sounds like, if I, if I understand it correctly, that, that interaction between IT and the business has become a decelerator, not an accelerator for most of these organizations. Is that is that a correct assessment? Yeah, IT, you know, I, my favorite story is we were we were building a prototype for one very, very large company um, and uh, the IT department didn't think this was a priority project, so they just totally ignored it. Um, and then uh, when we were just ready to go live, IT got in and went, whoa, you're going to be using this to do that? Oh, no. And then they put a hold on the whole thing because they wanted to go through and do redesign and everything. And literally, the company, that division just shut down. It was cheaper to shut the division down than to wow. go through all the IT stuff. That happened about 10 years ago. But IT is the breaks, typically, okay? Because mm -hmm. And so they got to be in the business of, they have to change their organization structure to be more about, you have to pick, they should be picking the platform, help uh, picking the platform, not necessarily picking it, but help picking it. They need to be have the standards around that platform and how things are implemented. Uh, for example, testing standards, quality control standards. But after that, they they really don't shouldn't get involved unless there's like, as Bill pointed out, an integration point to another system, uh, or maybe there's something that's so hard that they have to build out a you know a very customized web service or a or a mobile solution. But that's for like bespoke systems, you know, and and otherwise their their role is really changed into managing the and supporting the infrastructure that the sales team and the actual real customers let's say it that way want and demand i have a perspective here that the it group their role and i think it was said is changing and for example i think many customers now wants to know who should i call and what should i call talk to them about we're talking recommender systems that has a profound effect on how systems are are laid out and the capabilities. So I think IT in general has the need and the responsibility to provide new systems that don't exist today around big data, how data is organized. At the same time, it needs to be flexible, but not so flexible that they lose the, you know, the the ability to manage it. So I think their roles are changing, but very much with building the capabilities for business trends that really are evolving right now. Sebastian, I want to come back to you. I think you had something you wanted to say. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so for for sales leaders, so you're absolutely right. The, we're on the same page. Uh, the IT is becoming this where they know the best practices on how to you know, configure the software. And then to to sales leader, we always say we, we're doing implementation now, uh, and we train people day one. Normally, you know, a few years ago, we we're training people at the end. Now we're training super users day one, and then we co-configure together. So they contribute to the project. So they are autonomous. So that's what I, so it's the sales leader say, okay, we're going to train your, your super user or sales coordinator day one. So we're going to, they're going to understand how the platform works and send you going to be autonomous. So you can react way more rapidly than, than before. So I think we've done a great job of kind of talking about early on, we talked about some of the, the disruptions that are happening in the marketplace, how it's impacting sales and organizations and, and how they can, can accelerate change. So I want to, before we look to see if there's any questions, maybe give each of you an opportunity if you'd like to say any last words, again, on the topic of in this low code era, how companies can accelerate their sales processes, empowering their employees and overcoming these, these uh, market disruptions. If there's any final thoughts you'd like to share. Mm -hmm. I think it's an exciting time. And I think the employees using terms of use cases five, 10 years ago, that was not a common thing. So 
business process implemented correctly, quickly, and expansively um, is, is upon us, and it's going to continue. And so low code, no code, however we define it, is definitely a component of that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for the salespeople, you know, sales guys are not good data entry clerk. They are, you know, the sales guys are good at selling. So local, no code mean, means more selling time for your sales guys because they will spend less time into administrative stuff that they don't really like anyways. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, to me, that's simple. <laughs> it's, it's a fact. It's a fact. I'll, I'll testify. Uh, Sam? This, this is a new age where we're changing the way we do things. Uh, we're no longer um, having to deal with things like prospecting, and you know all those all that information is being digitally managed and sent to us just in time. This is the world of just in time sales, and so your salespeople should be able to do more with less because of so much automation, the AI learning machines, and then with the low code, it allows you to, to adapt. So you need to make your organization, particularly your sales organization, uh, structured around change because that's the constant thing that we see going forward. All right. Well, with that, uh, let me pause for a moment and see if there are any uh, questions that have come through. I, I don't uh, see any currently, but let's give it a moment. And let me take a moment just to thank you, uh, you three fine gentlemen, for taking the time with us today. I think this was a very robust conversation. I really appreciate your uh, your insights, and I look forward to spending some more time talking with you about this uh, in the future. So, with that, I think we'll we'll wrap the uh, the session today. Unless there are any questions from the audience. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thank you.